Hi, everybody. Welcome to the final event of our professional development week here at Pierce College. We're so glad that you're with us here today. Uh, while we began this week uh, telling you that our theme was resilience and reinvention, it's particularly fitting for this weird pandemic world we're living in. Um, but this theme was actually chosen before the pandemic, well before we had any idea of COVID or all of us working from home or anything like that. So why was resilience and reinvention so important? Because that phrase really is perfect to describe our Pierce students, alumni, and supporters. We are constantly growing our natural resilience, finding pockets of growth despite many obstacles and reinventing ourselves to meet the moment. So I'm so very glad to welcome our panelists this morning this afternoon. <laughs> um, each one of these panelists has a very different, very interesting, very relevant experience of reinventing themselves and their careers. We welcome Shuja Moore, Community Engagement Coordinator and Documentary Filmmaker. Excited to hear about that one. Dr. Stephanie Gibbs Amanaka. I practice too, Stephanie, I promise. <laughs> director of admissions here at Pierce College and Paul Herman, InfoSec Director at the University of Pennsylvania. Before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Again, you're welcome to keep your cameras on or off during this panel, uh, whatever your comfort level is. Please you know, feel free to make use of the chat and the reactions as we are talking to let us know what's resonating with you um, while our panelists are sharing their stories. Um, and we will also save some time at the end to allow for questions. So get ready for that. Uh, we welcome your, your questions for our panelists. At the end, we will also provide you a link to our survey for this event. Uh, please make sure you do that as your survey will serve for our submission to win one of three $100 gift cards. Um, and we want your feedback so we can grow and know what, what works for you uh, and how to get better. So without further ado, let's go to our panel. Uh, panelists, welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate your, your time and your, uh, your willingness to share your stories and your vulnerability. So um, let's start with, um, let's go ahead and start with Paul. Paul, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you had to reinvent your career? Sure. Um... Thank you, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, to, uh, for um, asking me to join the panel. Uh, every panel needs at least uh, one uh, elderly curmudgeon on it, so <laughs> I, serve, uh, I serve that purpose. Um, the, um, uh, my background, uh, my name is Paul Herman. Uh, I'm 69 years old. I live in Westchester. Uh, I'm married uh, with two adult children and uh, a very young uh, grandson. Uh, I graduated from the University of Delaware in uh, 1974 in computer science and statistics, and immediately uh, went to work for uh, the DuPont company in Delaware. Uh, I worked for DuPont for 18 years. Um, and then in the 1990s, uh, uh, downsizing uh, swept across the nation and every large corporation uh, uh, began to reduce their workforce. Um, as that happened, I saw the handwriting on the wall and I began accepting uh, calls from recruiters, which I had not done before while I was still employed. Uh, in 1991 at 40, uh, I packaged out of DuPont uh, in, in a downsizing promotion that they ran and began to work for Smith Pine Beach. Uh, in uh, 2000, uh, at 49 Smith Pine Beach uh, merged with Laxo Welcome, and I then was offered a package to exit. Um, at that time, I was the Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, I was 49 at the time again, and uh, at that point, I decided to form uh, a company. So I formed a company called Investigations that did uh, security investigations and electronic discovery for the legal industry. Uh, about 15 years later, uh, the e-discovery market became commoditized and it became increasingly difficult to make money uh, in that field. Uh, so I made the decision to dissolve the company uh, rather than draw down our assets. And uh, I began to search for another position. Um, uh, 
so at, at 65 in uh, 2016, um, I uh, took a position with the University of Pennsylvania uh, as the deputy CISO. And um, now um, it, at, in 2020, looking toward requ um, retirement and succession planning for my position, I um, relinquished that position and I now serve uh, as an employee advisor to the CISO and deputy and other pen executives. So that's sort of a brief history of my, uh, of my role, uh, my uh, professional career. So that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. We, we hear that you sort of had to step away and step back several times. So that's really interesting that you were ha having to continuously recalibrate. I think that uh, Paul's story is particularly interesting to uh, uh, our students, alumni, and supporters because sometimes we don't see what happens in someone's long and storied career. Many times of having to step back, reassess, pivot, and move forward in a different direction. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Dr. Gibbs Emanaka, can you tell us, introduce yourself and tell us about how you had to reinvent your career? Sure. So thank you so much, Leslie, for inviting me today. So I have a bit of a, a, a it's been a journey, needless to say. So when I was an undergrad, I studied communications. I was, I, I was dead set that I was going to be the next Oprah. I was like, Oprah is going to retire. I'm going to take over. And yes, that's what I want to do. And needless to say, that did not occur. And I was like, yeah, what else is there for me? And I looked at higher education. And um, after finishing up, I decided to take on the role of student affairs. And I jumped right in and I decided I was going to live as a resident hall coordinator with, I want to say, 100 freshmen, females at the time. And I was like, who thought this was a good idea? It was complete chaos most of the time because, you know, Students in college are up from, you know, sun up to, you know, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. So you would, I would have people banging on my dorm because I lived on campus with them in like two o'clock in the morning. Someone did something to me. And I was like, this is crazy times. And I was like, okay, I like working with students. And at that particular point, I decided to enroll in a master's program. And I was like, okay, I'm really going to sink my teeth into being in higher education. So I decided to go for my master's in higher education administration, organizational leadership. And I was like, okay, this is my chance to, to kind of refocus, reset. And I decided to uh, go into admissions, specifically undergrad admissions. So when I got my job in undergraduate admissions, I moved to Reading, Pennsylvania. It was a small liberal uh, arts institution. And they said, okay, we want you to be the recruiter for Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, New York. And I'm like, who put this schedule together? So the schedule that I received, I actually, one day, and it was in like 24 hours, I had to drive from Virginia to New York to be at high school events. And I was like, this is nuts. I was like, who's, you know, this is crazy. But it was so fun because I had opportunity to, again, learn about admissions, the field. And I was like, I like this. And I had opportunity at a fair, a older student, an adult student came up to me, uh, more non-traditional. And she said, I wanna do your DCP program, which was at the time our degree completion program. And I said, I know nothing about that program, but I wanted to learn more. So quickly as I'm sitting there at a fair, I'm like Googling all about our DCP program so I can tell the student about it. And she was like, oh, I'm excited. I'm gonna start right away. And I was like, look, these students know exactly what they want, in my mind, at least. I said that, right? They know exactly what they want. They're passionate. And I was like, I want to help the adult learner. I want to help the adult student. So I reset again. And I set out and I uh, ended up with a job in graduate recruitment. And I was working with master's students in Center City, Philadelphia. And it was the best. It was a crazy experience. And when I say I've had scheduling where I would be maybe in the building from eight, sometimes till 11 o'clock at night, because my previous uh, supervisor, she loved to talk. That was her thing. It's like, let's just sit here and talk. I'm like, it's 11 o'clock at night. Like I have places to be. And she supported me though. She allowed me to finish um, my doctoral degree at the time. She was like, I will let you go for every Friday from five to 10 o'clock. And I was a snoreboard. So I'm going to say that. Let me preface that. I was a complete snoreboard. I wasn't the person you call on the weekends to say, hey, Stephanie, let's hang out. No, because I was like five to 10. That was my time. 
Um, and I knew Friday, Saturday, Sunday was everything that I needed to do work and school related. So she supported me in that. And then there was a, another opportunity and I saw it as a challenge and I applied as a assistant director for um, graduate admissions. In that interview process, um, my former boss at the time was like, uh, I want you to be my director. And I was like, okay, if you think that's a good idea, sure, then let's go with it. <laughs> um, so I, I um, you know, decided to switch gears and I still stayed within graduate, but I had new undergraduate in terms of undergraduate, traditional and non-traditional a bit. And then I transitioned, like I said, to that leadership role. So this brings me to the big transition, right? So in this, I don't know about everyone here, but I didn't have children initially in the beginning of my journey. And I was like, I'm single, Neo, and I'm aging myself saying how old I am. So Neo had that song, Miss Independent. I had my own house, I had my own car. I was like, yes, I'm living life. And then I found love, right? And um, love came in the sense of online dating. And I met my husband on eHarmony, um, quick fact about me. And he lived in New Jersey. And I was like, did I just meet a man in New Jersey? I'm not from New Jersey. I'm originally from Delaware County. So I'm a Delco girl. And my family is from Chester, Pennsylvania. If you heard of Chester, Pennsylvania, it's like very small, like everybody knows your name kind of place. And my mom was like, you're leaving the area. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to leave the area. So I was like, okay. She was like, I'll support you. And I was like, you're saying that, but I don't know. And she was like, no, I am. Okay. And my mom loved my husband at the time. So I moved to Jersey. And let me tell you, I went to Jersey kicking and screaming because I was like, I don't want to reinvent myself anymore. And on my wedding, I, we got married in August. August, I want to say 27. Ooh. And literally I got back September and they were like, oh, just so you know, you're pregnant. And I was like, I'm pregnant. And I was like, I didn't have a chance to like, again, plan. I'm thinking we're gonna have this honeymoon phase. I'm thinking we're gonna have all this wonderful time, just me and him connecting. No, baby's coming. So I was like, what am I gonna do? I'm, I'm away from my family. I have no support systems. And I'm in New Jersey, not saying I, any, if anybody's from New Jersey, I love New Jersey now. However, at the time I was like, not New Jersey. I was like, I don't wanna be in New Jersey with no new baby and everything, I don't have my mother. So um, needless to say, my mom was like, everything's gonna be okay. My husband's like, we're all gonna, we're gonna be good. So I, So I was commuting. And for anyone that has a long commute, so I was dedicated to the cause. I would drive, I drove four hours round trip, trip nine months, eight, seven months, until I was seven months pregnant. So seven months pregnant, I was like, oh gosh, this is crazy. And needless to say, I did that for a stretch and then I couldn't do it anymore. And I then decided to transition to an academic position. And I was a full-time faculty member. Don't, and, and when I say I had to reinvent again, I was like, okay, this makes sense. Maybe I have more flexibility. I can deal with the new family piece. I'm in New Jersey. And I was like, this will help me, right? And needless to say, um, I was so happy I was able to find those transferable skills and, and, I'll, and I know Leslie's gonna ask probably a question later on about that. But you know, I was able to find that and was able to articulate that to the faculty at Kane and say, hey, you know, I can do this too. So they hired me, I was there for a year. Okay, there for a year, boom, pregnant again. Stephanie, what are you doing? Stephanie, this is baby number two, you're in the workforce. You barely can take care of the three-year-old, well, the two-year-old at the time you have, and now you're throwing another baby in here and it's like two years apart. So um, needless to say, I took a step back and I was like, I'm gonna be a stay-at-home mom. I was like, that makes the most sense to me. And all of my friends, all of my network was like, what? You're going to do what? This is not 1920. You're going to be a stay-at-home mom. I was like, this is what I have to do. I was like, I only feel comfortable doing this. And I didn't realize that was going to be a huge transition, but that was like a huge transition, going from dealing with adults and people and other leaders and, and thought thinkers. And not saying my children are not, but a three and one-year-old, our conversations of, you know, Elmo and, you know, baby shark are a lot different than what I was used to every day. So I had to change my whole idea of, oh gosh, then I'm with you all every single day. And then the pandemic hit. And then I transitioned again. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But then I transitioned and I got to Paris. So it's been a long ride. That's amazing. And thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think, um, you know, stay at home parenting is a whole other field. One that in full disclosure, when I became a parent, I was like, oh no, thank you. I declined this position. <laughs> Much love to my, my toddler, but Exactly. 
you know. Um, okay, so, all right, moving to Shuja, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you reinvented? Wow. Uh, again, I just want to say thanks for having me and I, you know, I appreciate being here. Um, yeah, my story is vastly different, um, but what I'm excited about is that I get to tell stories uh, about people that I care about, you know, the black and brown in the inner city community. I get to shoot footage, you know, add music, create these beautiful stories that people seem to really love and get paid to do it. So it's very exciting. And not only do I do that, um, I do community work. You know, we just finished providing uh, free home repairs to 10, 10 homeowners in the Dunlap section of West Philly. Uh, we did community cleanups. I'm working on a community garden. Today we're, we're providing senior food deliveries later on today. So, you know, I'm, I'm really happy and um, grateful that I get to help you know, help my community, right? But my life, it didn't start there. It didn't start there at all. Um, I'm from West Philly. Uh, my career really got going when I was 37 years old. I beat 39 in May, so two years ago. Um, up until that point, it, there was a lot of struggle. And how it all started was, I'm from West Philly, uh, born and raised, um, two great parents um, who were really, really restrictive uh, growing up. You know, they wanted to make sure that we were well-educated and that we, you know, um, made it out of the hood, so to speak. Um, but what what ultimately happened was I got heavily influenced by some of the uh, the light, the criminal lifestyle that was going on around me. Um, I grabbed from listening to music and watching all these movies. You know, I, I wanted to I wanted to be a boss. I wanted, you know, I didn't want to have to wake up and, and answer to anybody. I wanted my own money. I wanted to dress. I wanted to dress. I wanted the girls. And the only people who I saw doing that were guys standing on the corner. Um, and I was young, I wasn't able to, I didn't know what the full picture looked like. I didn't understand the relationship that crime and, and selling drugs was doing to my community. Um, but nevertheless, around 18 years old, I started selling drugs. And, you know, once you, once you, once you enter the game, you know, it takes on a life of its own. And I, uh, I started abusing drugs. I started carrying guns. And uh, <clears throat> after a few years of doing that, I found myself um, one night in a nightclub with friends partying, we're drinking, we're, we're young, we're aggressive. And uh, I actually got into a fight with a guy who I had had a, like a previous beef with. Um, we're arguing back and forth. I pulled the gun out on him. When I pulled the gun out on him, he immediately grabbed it. Uh, he grabbed the gun, the bouncers join in, and um, you know they think it's like a bottle or something. So now they're throwing us all over the place. They're trying to grab the bottle out of our hands and the shot went off. Um, that bullet went through the bouncer's thighs and pierced the abdomen of an innocent bystander uh, who was a friend of the person that I got into the fight with. And that man passed away the next day. Um, he was his mother's only child. And, um, you know, I'm totally embarrassed. Um, I destroyed that family. And I also changed the, tra the trajectory. And I would say even destroyed my family to an extent um, that night. And uh, ever since I've been on a journey of, of redemption and, um, mm -hmm. You know, really trying to embody what I believe restorative justice is, and that's when you you recognize you were wrong. You recognize the mentality you had was just totally crazy. I don't even know what other word to use. Um, but you 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 work on yourself, you heal yourself, and then you work to honor the persons that you might have hurt um, by doing good in the community. So um, that's how I've got to my career, and we can go into details of uh, what it was like, uh, kind of trying to reform myself on the inside and then building a, um, you know, a career on the outside. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I recognize that it's, you're right, it's tremendously different than the other stories that we shared, but a tremendously important viewpoint. Um, and and uh, so very inspiring to hear how you have given back to your community uh, after such a, such an event. So thank you very much for, for sharing that. And um, I apologize to the other panelists. That's why I made you go last. <laughs> Because I knew that was going to be, um, you know, so so uh, deep, and, and and thank you for sharing and being vulnerable with us. Um, so um, I guess actually, Shuja, can you answer the next question? What barriers did you face, and how did you overcome them? I think we can probably assume some barriers, but uh, can you go ahead and and uh, fill us in a little bit and how you overcame those barriers? Sure, sure. And to be honest, um, I think one of the things that I learned, I, I learned a lot of lessons in prison. A lot of lessons because after the first two years, I spent the last 10 years treating every experience that I had as preparation for when I came home. 
And um, and I and I give all credit to my parents for always holding me accountable. Um, <clears throat> but I switched my mind. I, I don't really look. I mean, barriers are there, but once I have a goal in mind, there's nothing that's going to stop me from achieving that goal until I realize that maybe that goal just isn't for me. And if that's not for me, then you have to pivot, and that's fine. That that happens in life. But as far as the door being closed, you know, you knock down the building to get the door. <laughs> that's kind of the mindset that I had. Um, but yes, there were, there were, there were many barriers. Um, I would say after about two years that I was home, um, had been working, you know, like little 13, 14 hour hour jobs. And it was cool. You know, I was, I was appreciative. I was able to, you know, get an apartment. I had a car, had things going for me. Um, but I was, I wasn't being fulfilled. I knew I, I have to do something. I know, you know, people say, Hey, you did your time, you, you know, you move on. But for me, I know I owe a debt. You know, I know there are people out there who are not whole because of me and my actions. So I just can't, you know, just having a job and not feeling like I'm doing something more, um, is, I'm not going to be happy. So um, I was recruited actually for a navigate, a reentry navigator position in Washington, D.C. Um, that I was really excited about. It was a nice salary. I was going to move, move out of Philly. Um, I love D.C. And uh, it's, a, it's a position that's needed because it's hard navigating out here and getting out of prison. So I was like, cool, cool. I mean, I, I went out there, I interviewed, I took all the tests um, and I was looking for apartments when I got the call to say, hey, there's a, actually a Department of Corrections policy out here that says you have to be home three years or more to get the job. I had only been home a year and a half. So I was like, wow. By then I had already quit the job that I had. So I wasn't, I wasn't excited to go back into the workforce. I said, you know what? You know, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Let me, let me, let me try some entrepreneurial things. And nothing worked. <laughs> you know, I, I was trying all these things. I, I had some friends, I had some relationships that I was leveraging and uh, yeah, nothing, nothing just really panned out. And ultimately towards the end of that year, it was 2018. I spent the last three months really just in my apartment depressed, watching my money dwindle, dwindle all the way, you know, away. Um, but during that, during that three month period, it was similar to kind of my prison experience where I, I went through the same process of like really thinking through what it is that I wanted to do. And um, because the last year and a half that I was home, there was so much coming at me, I kind of got lost myself again. And uh, I said, I, I slowed everything down. I wasn't really communicating with too many people. And I just thought back, I pulled out my old prison journals. And I said, you know, I, I don't like how, just plainly said, I don't like how black and brown people are represented on TV. You know, when you look at a lot of the characters on TV, especially for young people, they're criminals, they're bad people. And these are the people that we are supposed to look up to. And I said, I don't, I, I don't you know, and, and definitely I don't like how uh, people who are in prison or formerly incarcerated represented. So I said, I, you know, I'm not gonna wait for somebody to create the content that I wanna see. So I put out a Craigslist ad and uh, just told, you know, gave a brief summary of who I was and what I'm trying to do. And I was able to connect with some filmmakers um, and start to work on a project. So I, I, got, I was able to recruit one person from my team through that, through that method. Another thing that I did is I, I realized I really do love media and storytelling. And uh, I go, you know, I was going, this was pre-pandemic. Remember we used to go to screenings and all that stuff? Um, I went to a screening and I met another filmmaker that way. And, you know, I just told him the vision. I said, look, I don't have any money, but I'll find the money. When you put in the work, you know, I'll find the money. And um, to their credit, they worked with me pro bono for two and a half years now. Um, and we just went out, started creating these stories, filming the footage, and I, I became a producer. <laughs> I didn't know anything about it, but I was—I had a passion that fueled me because I know how important these stories were. So I spent all of 2019 filming, and I, I went and got a job, another little dead-end type of job that didn't even cover all of my bills. Um, but I was filming. I, the passion was there. And um, while we were doing that, the, the company that I was working for folded. And this is where I would say was the toughest time um, since I've been home. The company folded. Um, and then I had a decision to make. I still need a job. I still needed the income because at this time I, I, uh, I didn't even have money to pay my landlord when I didn't have any money coming in. What was I going to do? I can get another dead end type of job, but it really just sucked my soul out of me every day going to work. I had to do the film stuff just to feel happy. Um, but what I did was I, I said, if I'm a work, man, what type of work do I want to get? Because I knew I didn't have a degree. It was hard to just get a job. But I, I sat back and I realized, you know, I do have a ton of experience. I've mentored countless people in prison, in prison and outside of prison. I have, um, 
I've, I've learned how to communicate with prison guards who, <laughs> let's, let's be honest, they, they weren't the nicest type of people. Uh, and also prisoners, you know, people from all walks of life. I had to master how to communicate to them so that I can get the things that I needed to get to survive while, while I'm on the inside. And that's a skill. So I really just sat back and started identifying what are all the skills that I've amassed since, you know, since during my last few years. And I said, community engagement, um, you know, counseling. These, these are the things that I could do. Anything that had to do with reentry or dealing with black and brown people, I know how to do that, you know? So um, I started identifying those, job, those type of jobs, those type of positions. I did my best resume and cover letter explaining my situation and I hit the ground, right? So I'm knocking on all the doors. I'm, 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 I'm presenting myself. Cause I, I knew I had to show up. I couldn't just submit a resume. Cause once you Google me, it'd be like, oh no, we're not hiring this guy. Um, so I would, I would go to these places and I got some no's. I got quite a few no's, but uh, um, I got quite a few people to say, hey, Broad Street Ministry, a company called ESI. They say, hey, come in, let, let, me, let me help you. you. We may not have a position for you just yet, but let's, work, let's tweak that resume a little bit. Let's work on that cover letter. And um, the last thing I did was I found someone who was similarly positioned to me. Uh, he was a returning citizen that was a director in another company and I cyber stalked him. Wherever he was at, I would pop up there you know, suit, suit on, resume in hand, and just introduce myself. And, you know, over time, he would be like, everywhere I go, you, like, who are you? What are you doing? And I'm like, hey, I'm a filmmaker. You know, all I really had to represent my, 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 my skill set at that time was the film work that I had been doing. So I would say, hey, I'm a filmmaker, but I'm returning home and I really need a job because I'm broke. And, uh, you know, what's up? And he kept saying, yeah, call me, call me. I called him, he wouldn't answer. So maybe the, the last time, um, I, I snuck into a economy league event. I, I go there, I see he was there. He had tweet, he had like tweeted that he was going there this morning. I was like, yeah, got suited up, <laughs> went right down there. Um, so when I get to the entry, when I when I get to the door, um, they're like, you know, how you get there, you sign in and everything. Um, you know, I give him my name, Shujad Moore. And they say, oh, uh, Mr. Moore, we don't, we don't have you on the list. I said, what? I said, my secretary, you know what? She's fired, man, I, she did it again. And it was like, oh no, 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 you don't have you don't have to do it. Here, here you go, here goes your name tag, go up there. So I put the name tag on, I go upstairs, and uh he's there. He couldn't believe that I was in this event. This event was a little, you know, a little bit higher, um, higher level, like more big wigs were in the room. So when he saw me there, he, he was really shocked, like, oh, like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, listen, man, can I get five minutes? And he was like, yo, call me when you leave out of here, give me a call, let's meet, let's talk. Long story short, he ended up giving me, you know, helping me get my first job, real job in the workforce where I was doing community work and helping. And that was in, that was in, that was the end of 2019. 2020, moving into 2020, um, I was able, you know, the pandemic here, obviously, but I was, I was able to learn, oh, and one more thing. During the last few years, I had networked with someone for the organization I work with now called the Enterprise Center. I would always show up at events, speak, talk, you know, just, just introduce myself. And I was saying communication, I told him my story and I was saying communication with him about what I was doing. Hey, doing this film work now. Hey, just got a job over here. You know, hey, hey, hey. And uh, in the summer of 2020, he was like, yo, a position open, opened up at the Enterprise Center. You know, how about you interview for it? I was able to get the job, which was a goal. And that's how my career started, I would say. That's amazing. I love that that uh, persistence and um, you know, as you put it, cyber stalking. And <laughs> sometimes that's what it takes. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I see that you have your your documentary uh, URL and your your name there. So everybody, make sure you check that out. Um, all right. So uh, Stephanie, can you tell us uh, about what barriers you faced and how you overcame them? I don't even want to go now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, some barriers I feel like I faced had to do with my own, my own, um, my, me being self-conscious about myself, me not being as confident as I wanted to be in my own skill set and being able to, you know, sometimes hard to sit and toot your own horn and say, you know, oh, I'm really good at this, I'm really good at this. And I think oftentimes when you ask my, tell me about yourself, I feel like sometimes people are like, that's the hardest question to ask often because people are like, ugh. So for me, it was, I had to sit down with my old school pen and paper and I had to write down, you know, what are all the things that I'm good at? 
What are all the things and experiences that I've learned? And I had enlisted my mom, my dad, everybody that had been on journeys, my husband, everybody that was on journeys with me throughout my career and said, hey, am I missing something? Because I know sometimes for me, I can forget because some things start to just feel like they just all are colliding. And I'm like, okay, is today Monday? Is today Friday? Is the pandemic? I don't know what day it is. I'm just happy to survive. So, you know, for them, they reminded me of these things. I'm like, hey, remember you did this. So oftentimes, so I would definitely, um, for me, that was always a barrier of just knowing what my skills were and what would transfer, what were transferable. So, you know, I did that when I became a virtual uh, consultant, educational consultant. So I literally, in midst of being a stay-at-home mom, I kind of fought being a stay-at-home mom. I was like, okay, if I'm gonna be a stay-at-home mom, I can at least be a working stay-at-home mom. My son at the time was like literally six months. And my, in my thought, I got us all on a plane. We went to Arizona for a whole week of training. And my husband was like, I don't know about this. And I was like, no, you have to support me because you know, you want people to support you, but you also want to have realistic, you know, you have to be realistic too. And you have to set expectations for yourself. And I was like, no, I can do this. I can definitely do this. So I went, stayed in Arizona, came back. I literally worked at the job for maybe three weeks. And I say that to say that for me, it felt like I was failing, but you know what? It's not a failure when you when you don't succeed at something because you have to try it in order to know that this might not be for you or this isn't your season. Because I believe that we all have a season and we all are gonna have different times of success and different times of failure. And I think if we learn how to take that failure and learn from it, I think we are just better individuals at the end of the day because we're learning. I feel like sometimes I've always been taught to succeed but I've never been taught to fail and how to fail. So I've learned that throughout time and you know if from that transition I was like you know what I keep fighting the stay-at-home mom let me try to be the best stay-at-home mom I can be granted that was the hardest job I've had oh my gosh it was completely crazy in here let me just tell you that and I think it's okay to say that in those midst of obstacles and barriers the obstacles and barriers again was feeling no support sometimes but meaning because people can support you and people are around you but when I say support sometimes it's a mental thing too and for a mom I don't know about other people that have children but I, I have cried a lot in this house. I have screamed in this house. I have, you know, blew up and you read all those articles that say how to treat your kids. Don't do this, don't do that and everything. And I'm like, and I'm like, oh my God, I didn't give them a vegetable today. I'm a terrible parent. I didn't do this right. But you know, we have to give ourselves grace. And I think in the midst of, you know, trying to revent and, and, and recover from, you know, whatever the transition we're going through is to give grace and to give ourselves grace at the end of the day. And, you know, from that transition, it was hard for me in the, when I decided, you know what, my husband was like, Stephanie, it's time to go back to work. You know, my mentor was like, I think it's time for you to go back to work. Let's try, let me try it again. And I said, y'all think I should try it again. I think it's too late. I've been out the I was only a stay-at-home mom for two years, but for me, it had felt like an eternity. And I was just like, I don't think, you know, it's, I, I, you know, how do I dust myself off? Again, what are those skills that I've acquired while being a stay-at-home mom? And there were plenty, you know, I had, um, did the Pennsylvania Association of, uh, resume writers and I became a certified resume writer. I built my own website. I was like, I'm gonna be a consultant. I'm gonna do all this entrepreneur thing and, and everything. And I was like, maybe I'll do that on the side. I'll try some other things. And then my heart was like, Stephanie, you know, you really need to go back to enrollment. You know, you need to be back in admissions. And I think, and I say that too, because I think sometimes you know, in reinventing, we feel like we need to run away from what we're really good good at. And reinventing doesn't necessarily mean that I'm leaving a place and going to another, but we can reinvent ourselves in the same place that we are in often. And, you know, for me, it was, um, I didn't want to be in admissions in the beginning. And that's ultimately why I kind of transitioned out of admissions and enrollment. And then my life was like, no, don't run from your talents. Don't run for the things that you love. And then I ended up back in where I love to be at. So that's, that's some of the barriers, I would say. I, I love that. And I, I love that you mentioned, you know, you weren't taught how to fail and yet it's part of our lives. It's who we are and it, it's, it's what we have to deal with. Paul, can you tell us about some barriers and how you overcame them? Sure. Um, but first, I, I feel like I have to give some context because uh, the uh, barriers I face are, are uh, minuscule compared to the other panelists that uh, yet I, I will say that when you're going through them, they are, things are just as real and stressful uh, in, in, in your context, 
uh, as, as others. So um, uh, when, let me start with, uh, when I left DuPont to work for Smith Klein Beecham, that's a pretty normal thing to leave one company and, and work for another company. Not, you know, there's stress involved, of course, but um, it's very minor. Probably the biggest thing we had to do was relocate our, our family. Um, the, the big challenge in my life was when I left the corporate world to start my own business. Um, for 20 years before then, no one ever told me no. Um, no, no one ever uh, said go away to me. Um, and so when I, I started a business uh, and I had to sort of suddenly uh, go out and speak with uh, folks and ask them to buy my services, to buy into what I'm offering, and they slammed the door in front of my face, that was a context that I had never grown up with. I had never experienced. In the corporate world, there's a giant support structure behind you. You have an admin that you know removes the trivia from your life. You have a uh, petty cash drawer. You know, when you start your own business, every dollar comes out of your wallet um, that you spend. Uh, so you have to learn how to manage finance. Uh, it was a transition for, for our family to be grocery shopping at the dollar store. Um, you know, it's, it's a different world when, when you sort of, when you change things um, uh, to, that, to that level. So, you know, how did, how did I transition to, how did our family transition to, um, to get around some of these things? I recognized that um, when I would go in, I had a lot of emotional energy that got expend, expended every time I was told no, every time the door was closed. And so you have to manage that emotional energy. And the way you do that is through education. And so one of the messages I have is that in, in today's world, everybody has to be a lifelong student. You, you, you have to continually uh, go out and learn the new thing. So I found myself in a position that if I was gonna survive in my business, I had to go out and take courses in sales, courses in, in marketing. Uh, and I had to, um, I had to get these skills uh, at both an experience level and an academic level in order to, to, to become accomplished uh, at acting. And what that did is it, it removed, I, I saw sales and marketing and the door being closed, not so much as a reflection on me, but it's just a part of a process. And it became a numbers game. And uh, if I was, my company was gonna survive, I had to just do it. I had to do it and I had to not take it personally. I just had to, uh, uh, to, to go through that process. And this will come back later on in, in the next phase of, of my life when we decided to dissolve the company and I uh, decided to go back into, back into the workforce. So I found myself at 65 trying to enter an industry that, um, uh, you know, the technical in, uh, uh, industry doesn't necessarily view a 65 year old person as really, uh, you know, leading edge when it comes to technology. Um, and um, so I, I had to, uh, I had to think through that and it became a, a marketing and sales uh, thing at, once again. It was, I was gonna get a lot of no's uh, in terms of people entertaining me for a job. Uh, and yet uh, I just created spreadsheets and I just kept going down and kept knocking on doors. The thing that I found was um, that if I got an interview was to do my homework. I researched that company. I memorized what their mission statement was. I tried to understand what the culture of the company was. Um, I can, um, when I interviewed for Penn, Penn is an educational institution. Uh, I had made a list of possible questions they would ask me in the interview. And I had answers for every one of the questions I could think about. One of the questions is a common question. Why do you want to work at Penn? And so I, when they asked that question, I was ready. I said, uh, when I go on interviews, I look around the room at the people interviewing uh, and everybody looks like me. Uh, and um, I wanna work for an organization that values diversity. And uh, I could see when, uh, I could see in the room that when I said that it resonated. Uh, so, and that, that purely is understanding what that, that market sector values. 
and you know, educational institutions value inclusiveness, diversity, and uh, and and education and, and society and improvement. So making sure that uh, you can align yourself with that was one of the keys to success was to um, making sure you can embrace the mission of that organization uh, and, and, and you understand it. You know, and the other aspect of that is you really don't wanna work in, 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 a, in an area where you don't feel aligned. So, um, uh, so that, that's kind of the, the sort of the barriers I faced in, uh, in, in my journey. It, that was very, very helpful in, in hearing uh, how, you know, it sounds like a lot of people got like no's and had to face failure and rejection and keep going. And I love that, you know, you, you had to pivot to view rejection as part of just part of the process and the numbers game. So if I'm going to get rejected 75% of the time, well, I can't ask three people. Like I have to ask um, uh, lots of people. I'm not so great at math. Don't do that math. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, so Paul, can you, I know we're like running close on time, but can you tell us about how you evaluated the risks versus rewards? And, you know, how, how, did, you, how did you make those decisions? I, I, I guess I'm the first to start talking with the uh, mic uh, muted, so uh, <laughs> I take that badge. Uh, so, um, uh, there's a book called um, uh, "Who Moved My Cheese," uh, and it deals with uh, it, it deals a lot with um, not you, you know believing in in your analysis of what's happening in the world, and uh, and then not not sort of just sitting back and letting it happen to you, but um, uh, saying I believe this is what's happening, and uh, I'm going to trust my instinct and, and my analysis and my belief. So when when um, when the downsizing occurred, um, I saw that what was happening at DuPont and I moved before it happened to me. And when I left and, and worked for Smith Klein Beecham and the rest of the folks that stayed behind were outsourced to another company. So they no longer worked for DuPont. Um, that's when I worked for Smith Klein Beecham, they had a merger, I had no choice. I was told uh, your job will be ending. Um, at e when I worked for investigations, it was, I had to believe my business plan. My business plan said, the market you're, you're trying to serve is, is, is under cost pressure. It's gonna, it's gonna continue to decline. You're not gonna make any money there. I had to believe that in order to resolve, a, a, resolve the business and change and move forward. So I had to believe the analysis that, that we were doing uh, in order to make that change. Uh, in terms of, um, um, uh, retirement. I haven't made that transition successfully yet, so we'll have to see how that story, uh, 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 how that story ends. So uh, maybe uh, Shujo will make a documentary of uh, <laughs> the, the failure there. Uh, uh, so you know what? Um, what? what uh, um, I, I think the the main thing is is sort of to believe in yourself, uh, and uh, you, you know just think about things things a lot. And also, um, and this is the hardest thing is, I wish I could take back the time that I run my hands and expended the emotional energy around things and that kept me from even moving faster and harder. So, um, the, you know, mo almost all of us will go through tough times and have tough, tough decisions uh, that we have to make, but uh, almost all of us will come through the other end. Um, so that, that's, that's the message I have on that. That's a great perspective. And also, you know, I, I can imagine that after <clears throat> having successfully run a business for many years, that was, you know, a, a strong business, having to reassess and realize that the world had changed around you. Um, so important to, to stay connected with those indicators. Um, so props on that. And um, you know, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Stephanie, can you tell us about how, you know, you evaluated risk versus rewards for your story? Sure. So I um, kind of always start with like Stephen Covey. He always comes to mind of beginning with the end in mind, you know, and with that, I always think about what I want to be early on. And, and, and I set those goals. And for me, it's I like, I like vision boards. 
I like sitting down and I like to see visualize where I see myself, whether that's a house, whether that's a new job, whether that's whatever the field is that I'm interested in. You know, I've always been told since young, you know, to dress for the job you want, not the one you have, you know, and I think you have to, you know, for me, I always had to assess every job, no matter what the no matter what the title is big small leadership role whatever you know you have to live in it you have to be in it you have to own it and you make it great and I think therein lies what what I had to do when I was reassessing certain things because there were times when I was like ah you know what am I doing this I can do so much more but you know what maybe it's not my time yet because if I could do more and again not to bring religion into the place but if I could do more God would give me more and that's always the thing I look at. And it's about hard work and dedication and being persistent, being persistent. And that's kind of the risk for me, uh, you know, being scrambling with two kids in the morning, early morning and, and navigating the work world and trying to be successful. I'm like, there's no greater risk because I'm like, I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to fail at it at this point. And I have so many supports to help me. And I say enlist your supports that you have, but also keep keep going through it. It gets rough. And like Paul said, you know, you, you'll, you'll pull through and, you know, push. And that's it. That's great. Shuja, can you tell us about how you weighed risk versus rewards? Sure, sure. Um, and just, I would just like to emphasize that. I think uh, Stephanie and Paul have amazing stories. They're inspiring to me, uh, to be clear. Uh, um, but I, I think we kind of keep hearing the same things because they actually work. Um, when you take the time to find out who you are and what it is that you want to do, those things will propel you to, to move forward. Um, so the risk, it, you know, the reward becomes way higher than, than any risk because this is what I wanted want to do. And I would just say that my guiding light has always been, uh, is my head and my heart in alignment? You know, does this make sense mentally? And is this where, where my heart lies at? And I'm gonna go ahead and attack it. And um, if things don't work, you know, along that way, you just evaluate and if things aren't working, like Stephanie talked about, uh, even Paul talked about, then you have to pivot. And that's okay, too. You, you have to know, again, evaluate your head, your heart. Hey, you know what? This just is not working. And let me, let me, maybe I need to make a transition. And that's okay. Learning how to fail. That's, that's totally cool. This has all been amazing. Okay, so uh, I know that some people are bound to have some questions. So go ahead and you can, um, you know, raise your hand or unmute yourself and or put it in the chat, whatever your comfort level is. Um, if you have a question for somebody in particular, go ahead and address them. Uh, if not, then we'll have our panel respond as they, they will. And I got to say, I love evaluate if your head and your heart are aligned. That's just... I was typing that as you stopped talking, because <laughs> that's so good. Uh, Carl, I see your hand up, go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, panel, for a very enlightened um, perspective on all of it. Uh, my question is to all the panel, with uh, a support group, you know, that's, that's one thing that gets me through a lot. How do you get your support group to buy into uh, this is a pivot for me and uh, get them to actually buy into your pivot. Um, uh, what if I uh, try to? Sure. So um, uh, I think, uh, you know, anytime in my mind, um, anytime that you're, you're working with uh, a group of people and you're trying to, um, uh, uh, get, be aligned with with with, with them. Uh, there, there, there's a principle that I, I kind of learned very early in life. I used to be a scuba diver, and uh, I was very afraid. I, I had a lot of fear involved. And uh, what I found was in scuba diving, they, they you you're teamed up with a buddy. They call it the buddy system, and you go down underwater, and your job becomes looking out after your buddy, and um, uh, you're, when you, I found that I would go down underwater and I would be 30, 40, 50, 60 feet underwater. And I found that the person that I was with had as, just as much anxiety and fear as I had. And my, when my focus turned to protecting that person and helping the other person, I, all my fear just vanished. And it, it, it all went away and my job became helping others. 
and so when when I think about how we network and how we work with others and committees and everything else, uh, we always, you know, at times want benefit from that. And I think the fastest path to getting benefit from your peer groups and your network is to begin helping others. And so look for ways that you can you can reach out to people that in your in your group, help them first. And I think what happens magically, and I don't know why is that you will find that the rewards come back to you. Stephanie or Suja, do you wanna take that? Absolutely. I, you know, Paul, I, I love the fact that you just said, you know, helping others, you know, helping others is so important. Um, for me, my journey was a little bit different. Um, not in the perspective of same as similar to everyone here on the panel, but in terms of taking a step back from work for me, it was kind of trying to let my family know that, you know, this doesn't, mean, this isn't a setback, you know, per se. This is me kind of, kind of getting myself right back for a comeback, essentially, and allowing me to kind of get a chance to, you know, be calm and listen to my own thoughts and listen to, you know, what's going on with me and really dial into myself and 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 talk about self-love and and looking at yourself and how you sit back and you're like you know what i need to work on me and i need to evaluate me and i think your family your support your husbands whoever you have your friends when you start to say you know i'm doing this because it's going to make me better they're going to fall in line because they want you to be better you know and not everyone needs to be shared every detail now i'll tell you my truth is i have maybe i have a i have a really tight social group a social network but in terms of really being vulnerable i think you find those those two folks that you can really be vulnerable with um or find those other people that you feel connect with you and you thrive off of their energy um because you connect and you tell those stories to those individuals and then i always say i liked it was this one person that said to me um, a long time ago, they were like, you're either going to be a part of, you're either going to be a part of the journey or you're just going to be like someone watching watching me go, you know? So what 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 role do you want people to play? You know, do you want them to be in the car or do you want them to be the people that are kind of just standing there and waving at you and saying, I'll see you when you get to the other side of what you're going to be doing. So I can't really think of that uh, term that he used, but that's kind of summarizing how he said it. Yeah, uh, to jump in, I, I think that was a great question. Um, your network and relationships uh, are really, really important in life. To me, they're more valuable they're definitely more valuable than money. Um, and they're one of the things that have helped me greatly in life. And a quick story, um, the first job that I got that I uh, got when I got came home was um, working for a rehab company. I was a driver, I would transport the clients from the safe residences that we had them at to the, um, you know, um, to, to, you know, to, uh, the med to treatment, you know, they would see a therapist and, and, and stuff like that. So I got, I got to know a lot of the clients and I would just tell my story and I would build relationships with them. So in, back in 2019, when another company I was working for, same type of company, had folded, um, I wasn't making any money for like three months. And um, I had to make a decision on where I wanted to go with my career. And then that decision meant that I was gonna be unemployed for a while because I had to work hard to find the employment that I wanted. Well, to do that, I needed a couple of dollars just to eat, <laughs> you know? Um, and what I was able to do was uh, talk to some of the clients that I had known uh, and some of the people that I even knew in prison and had befriended and, to and told them my situation and said, hey, man, I just need to borrow a couple bucks. I'm out here. I'm trying to find a job. I'm going to make it happen. But is there anything you can give me to hold me over? And, you know, um, I'm just so thankful that clients that I work with and even people that I spent time in prison with we were happy to, you know, to loan me a few bucks just to get by. And I repaid everyone. So um, I would say just being honest with your friends, establishing who you are and what it is that you're trying to do. And people will invest in you because, um, you know, it happened to me. That's that's amazing. Thank you so much for everybody sharing that. Uh, we've got a question in the chat. Um, not everyone has a support system. Have you ever been in a state where you didn't see or have a support person? And if so, how did you deal with that? I'll, I'll jump back in if no one wants to go. Um, that that is a uh, um, to be honest. I I I I that's not my that's not my uh, scenario. I, I have loving parents. I have a family that has invested in me. But that, because I've gotten so much love and support, 
I've also wanted to show that I could be self-reliant as well, because I know that as an adult, you have to be that way. Um, anything, any love and support you get is truly a blessing. It's not, a, um, it's not what's supposed to happen or will happen, you know? Um, so uh, with that said, if I, don't, if I didn't have any support and there were times where I didn't rely on my support, um, I would say, you know, I guess you should try to cultivate that too. It's nothing wrong with trying to cultivate and building relationships. Um, I think that is something is important. Um, I also like something that Paul said when he, he said, uh, he talked about being well-researched and well-prepared for things. That's something that um, really sets you above when, when you get in different scenarios. You know, preparation, I'm not sure of what the phrase is, but preparation definitely uh, is a prerequisite for success. Absolutely. And, you know, with, and this is me being completely vulnerable in this moment of saying about support, right? So I think sometimes um, having two little ones and being kind of not, I don't live in California, but my family sometimes makes me feel as if I live in California. And in moments of trying to transition into even my newest role that I'm in, you know, trying to lock in daycare, trying to lock in childcare and help um, and, and elicit the, that help for my mom, you know, and other people. It's kind of like, you don't want to keep, you know, knocking on certain do certain people's doors after you utilize them so much. And you're like, okay, how am I going to do this myself? You know, how am I going to do this? And for me, it's like, okay, I guess I have to gather up all that strength in yourself, you know, and you kind of say, okay, I'm gonna do this. But also I kind of enlisted, like you said, um, you know, others on the panel, you know, I've enlisted, you know, my boss, I've enlisted, you know, people, the former bosses, I've enlisted other people in my network and said, hey, you know, can you um, assist me in, in some way? Let me tell you my truth. This is my truth and this is what I'm going through. And I think if we state our truths and we're, uh, we're honest about them, people listen and they're willing to give grace in that sense um, of that's what you're dealing with. So, you know, you're not always going to get support all the time, but when you do use it, but if you don't, then, you know, what do you do and how do you, you know, kind of work through those things is so important. And uh, for me, you know, my family right now is like, Stephanie, you might not want to do another job. And that's my truth. Um, and I'm like, but I think maybe I do, I don't know. But when you look at support, you know, when you talk about support, if you're not gonna have support, then how do you make certain decisions in your life? So I think that, I just wanted to put that out there. That is me being very vulnerable in this. Yeah, I feel um, a, a little bit, um, a little bit awkward in trying to answer this because I, 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 I also have a, an excellent support system. So you're, I'm talking from a framework where it's easy for me to say things and harder for people that actually uh, don't have, don't necessarily have the kind of support system that I have. I, but I, I guess what I would think of is that support, that the support system is something that you build. Um, you know, you, that you have the opportunity to find other people that also don't have the same kind of support system that that other people have, and to, I, I guess the only the only possible uh, path that I could see is is to try to build your support system. And and again, I come back to it's uh, it's easier to, in my mind to do some of these things when you can identify ways to help other people. And when when you do that, um, you become you become invested in each other, and you and your your support system starts to build. Um, uh, and again, I, I, I say this with all humility because uh, um, I know it's not an easy question uh, uh, to deal with. That I think that that's really good, and I, that's what I would that's what I would say too. Is um, you know, support systems are a two way street. Start pouring in, and eventually you'll have poured a foundation. Oh, pulled that metaphor out of the air. That's what I get for reading all those construction truck books to my toddler. <laughs> okay, so panelists, I know it's one o'clock. Um, if you have other uh, responsibilities, you need to jump off. I, I really just appreciate your time. We have one more question. So if you wanted to uh, pop off, totally understand if you're able to stay. Um, Marcy, can you go ahead and share your question? Um, my question was just around, first of all, as a career counselor, everything you have said today is just, you know, making me feel warm inside. Um, you've given so many good tips as far as how to pivot and um, how to handle career reinvention. My question is, how did you um, handle the situation from an emotional standpoint? Because we talk a lot about taking action, but there is this kind of gut 
punch that you take first, and then you have to kind of bring yourself to the next step and pivot and take the action. Uh, so my my first tip is um, uh, it's very helpful if your if your partner is a tad smarter than you are, um, <laughs> because uh, very often uh, very often they they can see the situation much differently than you can see it and give you the advice and counsel that you, uh, that you need. Um, I think I think trying to deny emotion in these in these challenging uh, challenging times is 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 pretty it, 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 I don't know that it serves us well. You know, I think it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be angry. Um, I think, I think that's where the, the you know training and understanding about viewing things more as a process, a life process, than um, than an event that's happening to you each time tends to, for me tends to be more helpful. It's um, um, uh, it's. It's it's something that you know you have to expect in life. You know, life was is is not always going to be rose you know rosy and and we're working out our way. Um, uh, uh, however, most things that we deal with, uh, there is an end to them, and, and and we usually come through successfully. And when we can, uh, I I I have props to uh, to uh, Stephanie for. Putting um, the baby shark and Stephen Covey into the same uh, 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 thing, but it's you know it's really uh, it's really uh, thinking about the end in mind. If you can keep if you can keep that end in mind, um, you, you know that getting from where you are now to that end, there is often a way that you can see through it, um, uh, and it's okay for you to be upset and, and emotional at times. For me. Um... I guess kind of again something about my past so I used to be a poet I used to do slam poetry back when I was in uh, college and I love writing um, for me I write when I'm going through something my first thing is to write I will write a novel I will write a book I'm like maybe you know I have like journals upon journals of journals just under my bed still in my family's home and even in my house right now where I've just been journaling I'm like, do you believe you wrote this at 14? I'm like, can you not go through all my stuff that I wrote at that point in my life? But, you know, I, I say that to say, I think expressing that emotion in, in some way where it is construct, it is going to give you, you know, help in that moment um, that, you know, makes sense. Use those tools that you have, whether it's medium, meditating, whether it's exercising, whether it's, you know, in that emotion or whatever that punch is, because you're right, Marcy, you take that punch and it's a gut punch and you're like, oh, you know, how do I move past this? You know, and for me, it's writing. Yes, um, this is a great, this is a great question because life is going to happen to us. And it's going, you know, we have highs and lows, we're happy and we're sad. And, 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 in, and in those low moments, it can get, it can get really bad and it can get dangerous. And we've seen people who weren't able to handle it. So um, one of the things that I've learned is that we really need to identify the things that make us happy and develop healthy coping mechanisms in life. A lot of, there's so many unhealthy coping mechanisms that people rely on. And we got, as much as we can, we got to try to fight against relying on those because they are unhealthy and find those healthy ones. And for me, I, you know, I love being near one of the rivers. I love being outside in the park and working from there. Sometimes just being in a house can get claustrophobic. And I just want to be outside, whether I go to a nearby Clark Park or I go by the Schuylkill and just work from there, read a book from there. I enjoy taking walks. I got a new bike. I ride my bike. You know, I love listening to live music. Um, one of the things that I did when I was um, working at the rehab company is uh, when I would take them to AA, you know, for their meetings, I would, you know, we were directed actually not to go into the meetings, but I would go into the meetings because I enjoyed just the fellowship from the meeting, how supportive of an environment it was. So, you know, building those relationships with people that where you can support each other. Um, all of those things, I think, um, but the bottom line is trying to uh, develop healthy coping mechanisms because life is definitely going to happen. Thank you so much to our panelists. This has been such uh, an inspirational uh, hour listening to your stories. Um, and and I, I think that we are all better for it. I know I am. So thank you so much to our panelists. 
Um, so we'll say goodbye to panelists. You're welcome to stick around if you'd like. Uh, but at this point, we will uh, move to uh, what you all have been waiting for, <laughs> which is uh, we're going to uh, share our, well, now I don't know if you can see my PowerPoint. So, <laughs> um, Marcy, can you verify if you can see the PowerPoint again? I can see it. <laughs> okay, good, no good, good. All right. <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, we want to go ahead and actually turn it over to Marcy, who's going to um, uh, reveal our uh, winners for this, the raffle for this week. Uh, we have used our survey to collect. Um, people, uh, their, your feedback, and also to enter you in for uh, a gift card, one of three $100 gift cards. Um, so Marcy, can you reveal our winners for this? I uh, can. And, all right, thank you, take it away. <laughs> so our uh, top three who have attended the most events are uh, Jay Frazier, Sasha Uden, and Cheryl David. So congratulations. Congratulations. We'll be in touch with all of you <laughs> through so email um, <laughs> to uh, get your gift card. And also, if you attended our Wednesday event, um, we uh, were able to raffle off two copies of one of our Wednesday panelists' books. Uh, I said that weird. The panelist, uh, Serena Moore Thomas, her book, Water Walker. Um, so, Marcy, can you reveal who our uh, winners for that were? Our winners for the um, book raffle were Michaela Stein Steinberg and Ariana, I'm going to mess her name up, Nermalitis, and I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, and congratulations to those winners. Um, I wanted to, first of all, if you are a peer student or alumni, invite you to uh, talk with us further to continue this great conversation that we've had this week. Uh, I've got our contact information on the screen. I also wanted you to know about upcoming, we have a virtual career fair on May 26th. We'd love to see you with that um, and, and meet with our uh, employer partners. So um, if you go to our career pay, our event page, then you'll see that on there. Um, we did the gift card raffle. And lastly, a huge, huge thank you to so many people for contributing to this. To shout out uh, Marcy Brown, Senna Awerico, Brad Hodge, Dr. Rita Tolliver Roberts for really helping me uh, get this, uh, this whole week off the ground and secure some amazing panelists and speakers for us. Uh, Carlene Sloan and Kelsey Lozicki for helping to market and promote it. Our presenters, uh, Caitlin, Devin, Ellen, Krista, Amy, Ruth Ann, and Student Financial Services team, Dr. Kathy Littlefield, Dr. Stephanie Donovan, our panelists from Wednesday, Don Bruno, Melissa Fox, Kate, Grace Castro, Serena Moore Thomas, Jennifer Carter Lawyer, and our panelists today, Shuja Moore, Dr. Stephanie Gibbs Emanaka, and Paul Herman. Thank you all so much. And thank you to our attendees. We have loved spending this week with you, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.